Well, my name is uh, Dr. Rick Rhodes, and I am the Associate Dean of the College of the Environment and Life Sciences, and I am here to uh, introduce this course. This course is Issues in Biotechnology, the Way We Work with Life. And this course has a host of different designations, but they all end in 190. So if you're registered for BCH 190, AFS 190, Bio 190, or XXX 190, you are in the right place, my friends. The other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to set the stage for not only today, but for the rest of the semester. And I wanted to share with you that you are a part of a larger whole. During the course of the semester, you'll see that every lecture and every lecturer will be filmed in the development of a course for online delivery. So each of you will become part of a significant academic archive. Yeah, you're gonna be part of an academic archive. Pretty awesome. But more importantly, you're all members of the 190 community and leading this community is one of the university's foremost scientists, Dr. Albert Kausch. Now, typically, when we do an academic introduction, most of us are compelled to give a pedigree. So I'm compelled to give Dr. Kausch's pedigree. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the State University of New York, a master's and PhD from Iowa State University. He's worked extensively in the biotech industry, and he has a joint appointment as a professor in the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology and in the Department of Plant Sciences. He's also the director of our Plant Biotechnology Laboratory. He's currently engaged in, in what I view as absolutely cutting edge research, research that is currently funded by the Department of Energy, and he's investigating and developing strategies for new bio-based renewable energy resources. And gang, I think that you are in for a good ride. So join me in greeting the man in black, your professor, Dr. Albert Kausch, please. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Um, as Dr. Rhodes just filled you in, um, you're in for quite a ride. Thanks again. I am Dr. Albert Kausch, and that was a brief introduction to my background. Uh, and to start off of this class, I wanted to give you a brief overview today of what we expect to accomplish and view during uh, this semester. Um, and we will accomplish this in the first lecture of this class. This class normally meets from 4 o'clock until 6.30. And I'll get into the course requirements and what we expect uh, you to deliver after um, a brief break after the first lecture. And during the second lecture, we will um, establish the foundations for what we'll be doing uh, in the class, what's required of you, and a, a little bit of a brief background. So as Dr. Rhodes mentioned, this class is cross-listed as 190 through several different um, departments. And uh, today, what we hope to accomplish is a brief overview. So I want to show you basically what you're in for in terms of an introduction into biotechnology. We understand that this is a diverse background. Some of you probably are life sciences majors and have a background in biology. Some of you may not at all. And that will not influence your grade in the least. I know that from previous experience in this course. So we can start off just in our preview here of asking a question like, what are the most significant human accomplishments over the last hundred years? Certainly a lot of different advances have occurred. Some of them, most commonly people answer things like, well, landing on the moon. And I would agree, uh, that was really quite an achievement, especially before computers. Um, nuclear power, underexploited even still. Antibiotics, that was good. A lot of us wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. The internet, obviously. 
The Haber-Borsch reaction I put on this list. You might want to look that one up. But what are the most significant human accomplishments ever? We might say fire. Yeah, that was a good day. It wasn't covered on Fox News, but uh, obviously it had a big impact. Language. The wheel. Not all societies had a wheel. Agriculture. Agriculture was only invented by humans about 10,000 years ago. And before there was agriculture, there was really no organized civilization. The advent of agriculture bought, brought property, property law. Writing was invented after agriculture. And I put on this list DNA technology. A recent event which will impact humans from now until when they are no longer. So what we hope to demonstrate in this class as a survey of what's going on with DNA technology and biotechnology in general is how it will impact our society today as well as future generations. As well as what are the opportunities that it creates not only for you as students, but also for our society to solve certain challenging problems. We will be using the eye clicker devices in this class that are um, remote control devices that we can use for polling as well as for um, registering you in the class. And I'll, we will be handing those out at the end of the um, first lecture. Clearly, we are in a crisis. I mean, almost anyone you ask would agree that this is true. In fact, we're not in one crisis. We're in several simultaneously. We're in an environmental crisis by any measure, a climate change crisis, global foreign policy, wars, energy, diminishing fossil fuels, world food resources, water availability, human health, but at the bottom or perhaps top of this list which influences all of the rest is human population. We're at 6.3 billion people now and during your lifetime that'll become 10 billion people. Imagine that the constraints that that puts on all of the rest of this. So what are the tools that would come to bear on influencing these crises? Certainly, world population is going to have a huge stress on all world resources. But this won't happen uniformly around the planet. 90% of the population increase in the next 30 years will be in third world cities. This is a picture of Mexico City, arguably the largest and perhaps the most polluted city on the planet. Oh, maybe Beijing. But as population increases, the stress on resources will become more extreme, in particular, water and arable land. Why don't we just grow more food, some people ask. There's only 3% of arable land left to grow that food on. So we can only increase food production by a meager 3%. Meanwhile, the population is going to nearly double. Well, now what are we going to do? Water will become as limiting as fossil fuels. Right now, about 40,000 people a day starve to death. And about another million will die of vitamin A deficiencies. Who will feed the people in the growing population? Will it be the northern hemisphere? Or will it be themselves? This brings into political consequence how these crises will be managed. The man who has bread has many problems. The man who has no bread has one. And how many people can we put here, really? Can we just keep stacking them up like cordwood, using all of these resources and expelling all of the byproducts? Um, there are basically two common points of view. The economist point of view, 
would say that when resources become limiting, we are innovative enough to think our way out of that. When we use up all the oil, we will think of alternatives. When we use up all the land, we will think of alternatives. So in the economist's point of view, there is no limit to population if innovation is the answer. The biologist, on the other hand, looks at population curves. If I were to take a petri plate and put a bacteria in there and monitor its growth, one cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, and so on, until it hooks up exponentially. And then eventually, resources become limiting. Toxics also accumulate. So you level off until eventually death overcomes life and it crashes. So the curve basically looks flat, goes exponential, levels off, and crashes to zero. All growth curves, uninfluenced by innovation, follow that same pattern. Right now, we are experiencing what will likely become a limitation in energy. And perhaps the most significant challenge to humans going forward will be to reconcile a sustainable source of energy. How many years of oil are left? The debate is out there. Is it 20? I guess it depends on how much we spill in the Gulf. Or is it 50? How many years of coal are left, and what will we do to the environment as we burn it all? You can imagine maybe 100 years from now people saying about oil, can you believe they just burned it? Hmm. So we're here to talk about biotechnology and its influence on some of these factors. But what is biotechnology, really? I said that agriculture was invented by humans 10,000 years ago. And we'll get into that more later uh, in, in this course, the influence of agriculture, that is. In our view of biotechnology today and its influence, we're really going to be focusing on this, in this class on the use of DNA biotechnology and as it influences our culture. So the structure of DNA was only elucidated a little more than 50 years ago by Watson and Crick. So from that meager description, we have traversed a development of technology which will influence humanity from now on going forward in all kinds of fields. And I hope to convince you of that in the next hour. If you look at this timeline, and we'll get back to this at a later date, but the first gene was cloned by Boyer, Cohen, and Berg at the University of San Francisco in 1972. We're going to use that word cloning in two ways in this class. To clone an organism is to make an entire identical copy of that organism. To clone a piece of DNA is to copy a piece of information that's encoded in DNA. In 1983, Palmiter and Brinster made the first genetically modified animal. That was at the Jackson Lab in Bar Harbor, Maine. And it, they did this by injecting a foreign piece of DNA into a mouse. So we've been able to genetically engineer animals since 1983. The first genetically engineered plant occurred in four different labs in different parts of the world. One of them, Mark Van Montague's lab in Ghent, put foreign genes into a tobacco plant demonstrating that you could do that, not that they wanted to improve tobacco. It was the white lab rat of the day. In 1990, a group working down the road from here at Pfizer in Groton, Connecticut, made the first genetically engineered maize plant. Corn, that is. Corn is a $53 billion industry in the United States right now. And 95% of it is genetically modified. On the heels of that followed the genetic modification of wheat, rice, and other plants. The first animal was cloned, uh, not in 1997, as we know about Dolly, 
but actually years earlier as a frog. Uh, the first mammal, Dolly, was cloned in 1997 by a group working in Scotland. And since this has been repeated many times in many different animals, mules, horses, cats, dogs, pigs, have all been cloned and genetically modified. The first genome, the first sequence of an organism was deciphered in 1995, very mechanically and very expensively, in a bacteria called Haemophilus influenza. It was years later, in 2001, that laboriously two groups worked out the sequence of all of the base pairs that spell for a human being. Three billion base pairs to an encode a U. And there's no U like U. So each one of these sequences is unique. That took several billion dollars and 10 years. In the next five years, you will have the capability of sequencing your own genome for less than $1,000 in less than a few weeks. And that will have significant impact on how you view yourself, medically as well as pharmacologically. Stem cells were first discovered in 1999, and the controversy rages on. What's going on with that? How do we make them? What's the promise? How are they used? What's the downside, really? What's the controversy? And who's going to make those decisions? Some politician who might know more than you? But I doubt it. The rice genome was sequenced in 2002, found to have twice as many genes as a human being. So if you think a human is complicated, at the genetic level, a rice plant is twice as complicated. So what we're going to do in this class is I've broken it down into basically two parts. The first third of this class, I will attempt to describe how life works. What is life? How do you go from DNA out to an organism that's capable of describing it, let alone cloning it and using it? And what are the techniques in biotechnology that are germane to this technology? How do we clone DNA? How do we sequence DNA? In the second two-thirds of the class, we will look at the different applications of biotechnology. Agriculture, medicine, pharmacy, forensics, bioweapons. But first, what is life? Sounds like an easy enough question. I asked this on some PhD qualifying exams and have watched people stumble. And some very smart people in the past have asked the same question. Erwin Schrodinger did a series, he's a particle physicist, was a particle physicist, did a series of lectures at Oxford in the 1940s addressing this question. What is it? If you think you can define it, you can almost find an exception out there somewhere. So biologically, what is it? At the DNA level, at the molecular level, at the gene expression level. What is it? How does it happen? How do we understand life from its mechanisms? What are the philosophical implications of understanding biological life? What are we doing here as a biological organism? Who are you? Yeah, you all have your own individual genome. What does that mean? Is consciousness a part of our biology or apart from it? Do we have genes, therefore we think? Is there really free will? Or do your genes predispose you? I couldn't help to do that crime. It's embedded in my behavior, which is my genetics. Really? But is there free will? Or is it just a biological construct as a result of random chance? Is there intrinsic meaning to any of this? Or is it merely the function of biological organisms? Is there purpose? So these are the questions that underlie the very simple possibility of asking what is life? And as I said, some smart people have asked this in the past. 
Schrodinger. And in this book published by Lynn Margulis, who is now a professor emeritus at University of Massachusetts, and I'll get back to some of her accomplishments uh, in a later lecture. She wrote this book with her son, Dorian Sagan, also asking the question, what is life? And I would encourage you to pick this up sometime and see what kinds of different answers she suggested. But we need to first look at how does life work? And there are other books that have looked at this. This one by Malin Hoagland and Bert Dotson I used to use in this class. And I will use several of the diagrams that they used in this as I think they're instructive. One thing that we realize, or at least I do, as a biologist and as I go through our society, is that very few people have an appreciation for this question, what is life? In fact, you learn the solar system in grade two. Whoever told you how life works? For that matter, how your own body works? Or how does a plant grow, really? And now we can clone any gene and move it into any organism. We can clone organisms. We can make tissues and petri plates. We can regenerate plants and animals from single cells. Remarkable. But how many people understand the basis of this? And now, you all are going to have to make decisions about this. Should we clone animals? Should we eat genetically modified plants? Is that OK? Who weighs in on this? And what's their educational level? Shouldn't we have DNA and biology now become a car common part of our educational process so that we can all weigh in on these very important decisions? And why is biotechnology so controversial? Go ahead, mention this at any dinner party. GMOs and plants, you'll start an argument. Stem cells, for sure. How do we feel about these topics? Apart from what we know about them mechanistically, should we support stem cell research? What's behind the rub? Should we conduct human genetic research? What's going to happen when you and your offspring or you and your siblings know your entire genetic sequence? Will this cause you to make decisions about your life differently? Should we support human cloning? It's banned in every country in the world, as far as I know. But I will make an attempt later to describe an ethic that might support it, as well as human genetic engineering. And what about bioweapons research? As I said, we can clone any gene and move it into any organism. The common bioweapons now that are considered a major threat are naturally occurring. Viruses have been made now de novo, simply from their DNA sequence. Synthetic biology is on our doorstep, simply by typing in the letters of A, G's, T's, and C's. Can you create an organism? Yeah, that's very likely. You could create an organism for good that would eat oil in the Gulf more efficiently. Or all these things have a darker side. And in all of this, who are we to be so arrogant to put our naughty thumb 